Welcome back to part three of our lecture on schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. In part two, we discussed schizophrenia. In this lecture, we'll, we will focus on the other psychotic disorders, specifically schizophreniform disorder, schizoaffective disorder, brief psychotic disorder, and delusional disorder. And then we will end with a brief review of the treatment that can be used for psychosis. Schizophreniform disorder. This is a disorder that looks exactly the same as schizophrenia. The symptoms are the same, the kinds of behaviors are the same. The only thing that differentiates the two is that there's a shorter duration. So they have the same identical sy symptoms and they, those symptoms persist for at least one month, but they end before hitting that six month period. And because it ends before six months, they cannot meet criteria for schizophrenia. So this would be potentially an in-between in diagnosis someone might have if they are waiting to hit the six month criteria for schizophrenia. But ideally this would be reserved for those individuals where they met the full criteria as far as symptoms, but then it ended before the six month period. So the symptoms may remit or they may be reclassified as schizophrenia if it, the symptoms continue more than the six months. In giving this diagnosis, we also offer particular specifiers, whether or not they have a good prognosis or without good prognosis. And good prognosis is indicated by having an onset within four weeks of behavior change. So something began to change, maybe they were acting differently, but they didn't have the full-blown delusions and hallucinations. You think of this maybe as a, a prodromal phase. So they had some oddities, some changes, but not the full-blown episode. But all of those changes started close in time within the last month of them meeting, having the full-blown disorder manifest. Interestingly, they also are likely to have good prognosis if they are confused at the height of their psychosis. And of course, if they have good pre-morbid social and occupational functioning, so if they were doing really well just prior to the onset of the disorder, that is something that predicts that they're gonna continue to do very well. And if there are no changes in their affect, so they are not blunted, they don't have flat affect, they, their affect has remained normal. All of those indicate that they're probably going to have a very good prognosis and it's unlikely to move into schizophrenia and it's unlikely to be as severe as, it, as others. Next is schizoaffective disorder. This can be a really difficult one for clinicians to parse apart because you need to get very precise time frames on when certain symptoms were present and when other symptoms were not present. And you need to be able to isolate it, but unfortunately, clients often are not in a position to give you really good information about these timelines. So this may be an area where you're able to talk to others who know the patient very well, Sometimes if they're inpatient, you might be able to actually measure out how long these different symptoms have been, but it can be very difficult to get an accurate diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. A couple of things that have to be present for this disorder. They meet criterion A of schizophrenia, and they have a mood episode at the exact same time. So remember, criterion A of schizophrenia is where they have delusions, hallucinations, disorganized behavior, and on top of that, they may have negative symptoms. So they're having two symptoms that indicate significant psychosis. And during that period of time, they may be having a full-blown manic episode or a full-blown depressive episode. In addition to that, you have to be able to identify that there was a period of time where they had delusions and hallucinations that lasted for at least two weeks without having a mood episode at the same time. So first that they have them at the same time, then that they have psychosis without the mood for a small period of time. But if you look over the entire course of the disorder, you have to see that they've had the mood episodes at the same time as of the psychosis for the majority of the time. So even though you've isolated two weeks where they didn't have mood symptoms, overall what you're seeing is that they have both for the majority of the disorder. In addition, if you look at their active and their residual periods of the disorder, they still have mood symptoms. So as an example of what this would look like, someone may have had hallucinations and delusions for a few months before the onset of a major depressive episode, but then for the majority of their period of illness, which can be for decades, they experience both psychosis and a major depressive episode at the same time. 
even after the psychosis has dwindled and they've moved into the residual phase of the psychosis, those mood symptoms persist. So for this disorder, we add the specifiers of either bipolar type, if they have mania and, and depression, or if they just have mania, or depressive type, if they've only had major depressive episodes. So you can imagine if somebody has active psychosis and active mood episodes, and that is their normal functioning, these are likely to be people who are far more severe than some of the other categories than if they had just schizophrenia or if they had just mood episodes. So these individuals often have chronic difficulties adjusting in the world, being able to hold a job. They often become socially very isolated. They may struggle to take care of their own basic care and often have thoughts of suicide. It's also very difficult to find the correct medication and dosing for patients. And often treatment is going to require combinations of both antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, antidepressants, and then having psychotherapy on top of that. And the psychotherapy might be an individual, group work, or bringing in family and caretakers. There are even cases where patients have not had success using these other forms of medications and therapy, and they have used electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, and have found that to be helpful. Brief psychotic disorder is a psychotic disorder that lasts from only one day, as little as one day, but no longer than a full month. And during that time, they have to have at least one of these symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and disorganized or catatonic behavior. Unlike schizophrenia, where they had to have at least two of them, and also schizophreniform, where they had to have at least two of these symptoms, for brief psychotic disorder, they can have only one, and that would be sufficient. And the other key here is that it's from one day to just under one month. This timeline is really important because if you think about it, for schizophreniform, you're at one month to just under six months. And for schizophrenia, you're over six months. So this is addressing that time frame where they're under a month and they are kind of in limbo with diagnoses. Ideally, it may be a little less severe because they only have to have one of the following. But remember, theoretically, they could have all of them. But because they didn't, don't get to that one month period, they would not count for schizophreniform and they would not count for schizophrenia. The nice thing about brief psychotic disorder is that the individual returns to their full level of prior functioning, and it's very unusual that these individuals will relapse and have a second psychotic episode. In fact, if they do have recurrent episodes of psychosis, it's probably a good indication that there is a different disorder. It's not actually brief psychotic disorder. Often people will have the onset of a brief psychotic episode after a really significant event in their life, something that's very, very stressful for them. And this may be things as significant as trauma due to warfare or loss of a significant person in their life. Delusional disorder is a condition where they have persistent and delusional beliefs but they do not have beliefs that are what we call bizarre. Those bizarre beliefs were the ones where they believed something was happening that we know defies laws of physics. Their beliefs are non-bizarre, meaning they are things that actually could happen in real life. Being followed, it's, it's possible that you're being followed. Somebody being in love with you, that's possible. They do still often have paranoid themes and they've never met criterion A of schizophrenia. That means they don't have hallucinations, they do not have disorganized behavior or speech, and they do not have any of the negative symptoms. Actually, if you look at them outside of the delusion that they're having, typically their functioning is perfectly fine. They have no impairments outside of that single delusion. For delusional disorder, we also look at what are the subtypes of the delusions that they have. So how are the delusions classified? There's erotomatic, where they believe that someone of a much higher social status is in love with them. For example, believing there is a famous movie star or the president that is in love with them. Again, even though they haven't met, even though they don't know one another, believing that this is true. Somatic are delusions about physical defects, disease, or disorder involving the body. So believing that foul odors are emanating from their body. The difference between this and body dysmorphic disorder is that 
you may not see the kinds of extreme changes in behaviors that you see with body dysmorphic disorder. So they may have this belief, but interestingly, they're not doing things as if it were true, even though they fully believe it. In body dysmorphic disorder, they have that belief, but then they also engage in a variety of behaviors to try to cover up their delusion about their body. Grandiose, inflated beliefs about their worth, importance, power, or knowledge. We've talked about that many times in other disorders. Jealous, delusions of jealousy, where the person is convinced their partner or their lover is unfaithful to them. And again, what's important about delusions is there's no evidence that it is true. And in fact, there may even be plenty of evidence that disproves that it's possible and they continue to believe it. Then there's persecutory. This is the most common type. Here you see themes of being conspired against, people following them to do them harm, cheating them, any ways that others are persecuting them. Then mixed, where the delusions that they have fall into multiple categories, and unspecified, where their delusions don't really fall into any of these categories, and it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what the delusion would be. Let's move into what are some of the things that we do in addressing psychosis and therapy. And specifically, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, has been used very successfully in helping individuals who are experiencing psychosis. But it's not necessarily working on the things that you might assume, like directly targeting getting rid of the psychosis. Instead, a big part of CBT for managing psychosis involves psychoeducation, as well as normalizing the symptoms that they're having for the individual. For example, if we teach people that when they are having auditory hallucinations, it's actually coming from the part of the brain that's generating knowledge or generating language. It's not coming from the part of the brain that interprets language. And then we can teach them that they're actually hearing their own thoughts as if they were outside, but they're not actually really happening. By teaching people the information about the brain and how it's working and that this is normal, this is what happens for everyone who has auditory hallucinations, that is empowering them to challenge the thoughts that they're having in, in their head and the beliefs that these are real. You may also use cognitive behavioral therapy to manage psychosis in helping them improve their executive functioning, so their ability to plan, their ability to kind of manage a schedule and take care of daily tasks. CBT can be used to identify and address the beliefs that may be actually increasing their symptoms. If they are engaging in avoidance because they are anxious about whatever the thought is telling them in their head, then being able to get them to stop avoiding and actually begin to address those, like you might with uh, CBT for social anxiety, getting them to end the avoidance will actually reduce the anxiety and it will reduce the strength of the voice in their head. You can also help them to test out their beliefs that are coming from the psychosis. I'm gonna switch to a video that will show you a session where they're actually helping the individual test out this belief that he has about the voices and other people being able to hear them. So I've just been hearing about this belief that everyone's hearing your thoughts, that they're kind of somehow being transmitted mm. into their heads. And it sounds as though out of all the things that are going on, that's the thing that's most distressing for you, that other people can actually read your thoughts. I could cope with all of the rest, but I'm really anxious. Yeah, I'm sweating just now and I'm really worried about all these people knowing my thoughts. Right, okay. I mean, one of the things that I think we need to do is to try and get some more evidence, really, to find out, you know, what is really going on here. Oh, I wish we knew. Because it seems like there's, there's something going on. There's something going but, on. But well, I'm not quite sure what it is. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is to try and do some kind of an experiment so that we can gather some more information and, and see what happens. Okay. So I'd like to think of an experiment in some ways that tests out whether people can read your thoughts. Is that, that's really the crux of it all. That's what I want to do. Okay. I'm just wondering if you've got any kind of creative ideas that you could think of that would find out whether or not people are, you know, that, we, that if I was watching, mm. um, we'd know one way or the other. Or find a bit more information about what's so going on. So we're both going to watch. Well, I was just thinking it might be useful if I was there, uh, yeah. because at the moment, I mean, how at the moment do you know that people are reading, reading your thoughts? 
well, I stay in, in my flat a lot, as you know, because yeah. I'm a bit too scared to go out. But um, sometimes, maybe it's like once every couple of hours, I can feel it starting to come on. Right. And, and then there's the whoosh. Yeah. Thoughts go on, empty head, and it goes out. And I look out the window, and I can see that, like, there's one woman talking to another woman, and she turns, she right. turns her head away. I'm thinking, oh, jings. So gone out again. So it's something about how people react at that time. Absolutely. Right, okay. So, a any thoughts about what we might be able to do? Um, I think a really funny joke. Okay. But my thoughts aren't like that. My thoughts are mixed up and okay. sad and shameful. Can you think of something that would get a real reaction from people in terms of behaviour that we could observe? Um, um, something that, you know, there would be absolutely no questions about what was going on in terms of their, how people reacted in, in terms of behaviour. In terms of seeing them actually moving. That might be something that um, would be quite useful, yeah. Well, suppose, I think, I thought, that a, you know that band One Direction? I've heard of them. So as I say, One Direction are about to open a supermarket in the shopping centre. Okay. Because like people go crazy for them. Okay. So if you had that thought, anyway, yeah. Yeah. what would we expect to see? Well, I think some people will be disgusted because they don't like them. <laughs> right. But lots of people will be running to the supermarket, okay. I think. Right. So if I was with you and I said, right, you need to keep having that thought. Yeah. Would I, We would see people running towards the supermarket. You would definitely see some of the younger end of the market running. Okay, then. Okay, so that would prove that, that it would, that people were actually getting that thought. Yeah, it would. Okay, if we were in that situation and people didn't start running, what do you think that would mean? Might mean they don't like One Direction. Um, might mean they didn't pick it up. Right. Might mean they're preoccupied with their own thoughts. I don't know. Right, because I'm just wondering if we're going to set this up as an experiment, we've got to think about what you know how we're going to interpret the results when we see mm. them so i suppose that's one thing it needs to be something that we're pretty convinced that if we don't get a result yeah there's a good chance it means they're not picking up your thoughts if you know what i mean it needs to be something bigger than this one direction thing doesn't it i just wonder. like maybe um some kind of super sale okay things are cut to 20 percent of the proper price okay Really right. nice furniture and clothes and stuff. Right, okay. And what would happen if people didn't run this when they got that thought? What would that mean? Well, I suppose that I'd start to wonder if the thoughts were going to them. Okay, so it might make you wonder whether or not it was happening or not. Yeah. Okay, because yeah, it needs to be a valid like... experiment, I suppose. That's what yeah. I'm trying to get at. It's no good setting up an experiment if it doesn't really give us any more information. But if it's not going to them, where are they going? Mm. Well, perhaps that's the next thing to think about. So first mm. of all, is it going to the other folks? Okay. And then the next bit is, well, if it's not, because mm. we don't know, it might be that everyone starts running through the shopping centre at this right. stage, in which case we're going to have to deal with that. Mm. Um, but for now, um, I suppose we just need to look at that. So... Is there a certain time or kind of shopping, particular shopping centre we need to go to or? Well, we can look at my window and we can see the shopping centre. Okay, so. And it's every couple of hours this happens. Right, so we could do it from your flat mm -hmm. and we could actually observe what's mm -hmm. going on outside. Mm -hmm. And you'd be happy that that was a, a pretty decent experiment to yeah. test things out. If you were there, that would really help me. Okay. Okay, then should we arrange a time then and we can set that up? Mm -hmm. What you saw there was he had this belief that everybody else could hear his thoughts, but he wasn't sure how to go about challenging that. So they had to come together and create a plan for challenging or at least 
experimenting to see could other people really hear his thoughts. And they worked together to find a way where if people didn't respond, he would then feel pretty confident that it was that they could not hear his thoughts. And people in therapy for psychosis, this might be a very common thing that you're doing. You're helping them identify what the beliefs are that they have and then doing things to test out whether or not they're true and then doing them in a way where the individual feels confident that the results are valid. In therapy, we also would do things to help change the meta beliefs they have about the intrusive thoughts. So meta beliefs are kind of your, your beliefs about your beliefs or so your meta thoughts, your thoughts about your thoughts. So helping them neutralize some of the meta beliefs that they have about the intrusive thoughts that might actually be fostering or fueling their psychosis and their, their impact on functioning. For example, it's very common for people to say, well, if I think about what's going on in my head, then I'm going to really go crazy. So I'm going to try to avoid thinking about it. Well, we know that avoidance is going to make things worse and we can target that belief that if I think about it, then I'll really go crazy. If we can change that belief, then they're going to be more willing to engage in the processes that will help them identify those thoughts and neutralize them. So we want to change avoidance. And finally, we would engage in CBT to manage psychosis to also address any of the comorbid conditions the individual might have. You can imagine if you have auditory hallucinations, it could lead to additional social anxiety. And we know how to use CBT to help treat the social anxiety. So if we do CBT addressing social anxiety, the person's overall picture and symptomology should improve. Even though psychosis often feels like it's a very different type of thing to target in therapy, hopefully what this shows you is that there are still many different things we can do to help people in order to function better, in order to manage their reactions to the thoughts that they're having in their head or to the psychosis so that they can be more functional. There are actually many examples of people being able to successfully navigate their day because they have ways of challenging their psychosis and going forward despite having those kinds of thoughts. This concludes our lecture on schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. Stay well.